for those of you that think this is crazy, they should go to Matthew and see where Jesus sat down to teach them. So I'm just being like Jesus. Of course, I'm not going to teach you anything. Imagine that most everybody here knows what I'm going to say already. But there's something special about being reminded of God's love and about why we do what we do. And so we're going to do this. Clint's been working on a series in 1 John. And he said, I can do and talk about anything I like, but he's at 1 John 4. So if I want to do that, that's good. And I thought, okay, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do John's thing. And I was going to go to the book of Philemon, and I was going to talk about Paul sending the slave back to his owner, who he'd run away from and stolen from, and, and how Paul was going to say, like, hey, I could order you to do this as an apostle. If he owes you anything, I'll pay it back because, hey, it's that important to me that you accept him, that you forgive him, that you restore him, and it's going to be so much better. Maybe the whole reason he ran away was that he could come to know Christ so you would have a brother back, not just a slave. And I was thinking about all those messages in there that... And the one that got me was the one that said, I'm not going to tell you what you have to do because I know you'll do the right thing because you are a friend of Jesus. I want you to do it because you love. And that will be such a blessing for you because when you're just following orders, when you're just doing what you're supposed to do, what credit is it? You don't even feel good. You just feel like somebody's making me do stuff. But if you think about it, you'll do it because you're a Christian. And that'll be a great benefit for you. It'll cheer my heart. It'll be great for Onesimus, the slave. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to read 1 John 4. Because, you know, this guy named the Holy Spirit does these things. And then it was like, wow. It's all about why we do what we do. Because we're a friend of Jesus and because he loved us first. And that's why we love others. I thought, wow. Jesus was preparing me to preach this sermon. I'm even going to use the same illustration to start I would have for Philemon. And I thought the kids weren't going downstairs, so I had in my mind to bring a spade, and I was going to ask the kids to hit me with the spade <laughs> on the back of the head. I was going to have three or four of them, and I was going to tell them ahead of time, don't hit me, please. <laughs> but the idea was, the first one, I'd say, well, why didn't you hit me? And he would say, well, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> Actually, if I could, if I had a big enough kid, I was going to have him say, because I don't like the taste of institutionalized food. <laughs> and the second was going to say something to the effect of, well, it's against my moral code. My parents taught me to be good. And the last one would say, because you're my friend, and I care about you, and I don't want to hurt you. And then I was going to ask you, when the lights go out, and nobody's going to find out, which one would you trust not to hit you on the head with the spade? But I thought, we're mature here, so we're going to do something positive instead of negative. Let's assume I gave you my bank card with my PIN number. That's not much of a stretch because there's no money in my bank. Um, <laughs> let's pretend one of your aunts, who's like the one that has money, gave you her bank card and her PIN number. Just to run down and get something so she could and you have this wow moment. 
I could clean her out. But I don't like the taste of institutionalized food. <laughs> or I'm a good person and I wouldn't steal. Or let's add another one. What about everybody would find out and my reputation is worth more than money? What about because I love my aunt and I wouldn't do anything that hurts her? You see, Clint's been going through the book of First John and he's been saying things like, well, you better behave because Christians don't act like the world acts. If you're a Christian, you will. And if you are, you're not really part of this whole thing. And part of me is listening to all this, and it's like, those are so true. These are specific things. Like, there are no murderers. There are no adulterers. There are no... But then there's also Romans 7 that says, the very things I want to do, sometimes I don't do. Sometimes the very things I don't want to do, I uh, see I did them. I got a new job, and I do the H&P method of typing, hunt and peck. And I'm going to be doing a lot of typing, and my boss is looking over my shoulders, and she says, um, what about putting your fingers on the... <laughs> and I said, oh, well, I took typing in school. But I think I've broken each and every one of my fingers at one time or another, you know, playing football with small man complex, especially flag football for a few years. And then I thought, that was a lie. Those are true, but that's not the reason. It's because I've never disciplined myself. And so later in the day, I went to her and I said, you know, that's true. You can see my knuckles. But I've never really had to do a lot of typing. And since grade 10, when I got my pass at 25 words per minute, I just haven't. And so I owned up. Part of it is this image thing. So why did I do that? I was thinking to myself this week. Why do the very things I don't want to do lie? Why do I do it? Well, Romans goes into like great lengths. It's like, hey, we have our old carnal nature still living here. We're still, we're redeemed. We're forgiven. We're, we're justified. We are on our way to heaven. We don't. But sometimes we do. But thanks be to God. Our Savior Jesus has redeemed us, forgives us, and is sanctifying us, helping us grow more and more into the image of Christ. I think those are, out of three chapters of Hebrews, all those things. At the end he says, yeah, but it's my choice to follow Christ. It's no longer me that sins, but sin that dwells in me. So, wow. God's always there every day, ready to restore, redeem, enable, and he gives us those aha moments, like with the typing. Why would I lie? It wasn't even a real lie. It was like I was justifying poor behavior. Why do we hide? In our chapter four, let's read it, and then we're going to come back to some other stuff. So if everybody who wants to turn in their Bibles to 1 John 4, about 20 pages from the back of your Bible. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. 
This is a spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us because, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This, can somebody please get me a glass of water? I would appreciate that. I'll even drink the water from the tap where there's a sign saying boil water notice. I mean, I'm bad. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but who is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. That is part of chapter 4. It's not what I think the Holy Spirit wanted me to talk about. That's kind of the neat thing about God is that he, every time we open God's word, we see something and sometimes you have those kind of like, aha, it's like, yeah, somebody who says that Jesus is not God's son, somebody who says that he didn't really come, it was just metaphorical, somebody says he didn't really die for your sins and come back to life, that's not from God, just that plain, and in fact, one of the things we get caught up on is those buzzwords like antichrist. <laughs> One of Ginny and Laurel's cousins married a guy named Larry Van Beek. We all call him the Beaker. People that knew him before he was Dr. Larry Van Beek and the register at, at uh, Trinity. He said to me one time when he was speaking at Northern Pentecostal camp up by Thompson, Manitoba. He said, they've asked me to speak on Revelation. And I'll speak on Revelation, but I wonder how many people come after they find out I don't know who the Antichrist is. It's like, it's, it's a buzz thing, this Antichrist thing. So we get caught up in the first six verses, but then we get into the part that I think fits in with the rest of First John. Dear friends, let us love one another. That's good. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love doesn't know God, because God is love. This is how we know that God, this is how God showed us his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is life, love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atonementing sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God loves lives in us and his love is made complete in us this is how we know that we love him this is a problem with memorizing things as a kid we all memorized in King James <laughs> do you ever do that and then you have to read out loud and half the King James is coming out <laughs> this is from the New International Version saying the exact same thing in modern English this is how we know that we live in him and he is in us. He has given us of his spirit and we are seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. 
There's no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love his brother and sister whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love his brother and sister. Lord, would you please just have the things that are John's thoughts wash over and not even stick and certainly not cause a stumbling where people can't hear the truth that does come from you. Lord, I pray for aha moments, for discovered truth, for times when your Holy Spirit speaks directly into people's hearts. And I thank you for giving me the privilege of just walking through this text with them. In Christ's name, amen. There's a few things I think we have to do if we're going to look at a text like that. We have to put some definitions around words because the word love in the English language carries with it so many things. It carries with it those warm fuzzies. Love is an action and a verb in the context here. It's not somebody who just, I am so enamored by everybody who loves Jesus, they're my... They're all my best friends forever. Or do I act loving towards other people? There's a big difference. I think that the truth is there's some of both. But this is talking about acting in love towards other children of God. The chapter before was saying, you know, if somebody has a need and they're desperate and you have it within your power to help them and you don't, you don't have the love of God. And that was in the same context. It wasn't about warm fuzzies. It was about what will you do because God loved you first. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking sometimes it's just that it's out of sight, out of mind. I don't think of God's love as why I don't act the way I should. Okay, back to... Hebrews 7, sometimes I don't do the things I should, but when my mind's in the right place, I think I'm trying to act loving, especially to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I was praying about this, and I, I had this thought of, you know how you have these memories that God just shows you something, and it's like, I don't know if it's for everybody, but it was for me. I remember going to a wedding, and at this wedding, there was a, a lady who had had a little girl when she was in her teens. Her dad was a pastor, and it was kind of one of those, ah, oh, things. But she loved this little girl, and she cared for her so much. And she was almost 10, I think, when her mom got married. And as part of the wedding ceremony, dad came and he got down on one knee, and he said, will you let me be your dad? and asked for permission, and loved on that girl for the rest of his life. Well, he's still alive, so I imagine he still is, but last time I checked in on him, <laughs> and it was a beautiful moment because it was like, he loves that girl's mother so much, automatically that love spread to her daughter. And I think it was like Jesus was saying to me, you know, when God says you to act loving to his children, to your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's very much like it's because we love him and he loved us that you're his adopted children. You're my adopted brothers and sisters in Christ. And when I see myself not acting in a loving way to somebody, yeah, I got a little shame and whatever and I shouldn't have done. But really, I know that I'm doing this for Christ because he loved me first. 
It wasn't a, an accident that he made the first step. I thought it was kind of neat when God was showing me this. I thought of up until now, the whole time I'm preparing the sermon, it was all about us being a friend of Christ, brothers and sisters. And then it was like the marriage supper of the Lamb. We are like the bride of Christ. And his children are like family. What makes it so special is that Christ loves you. We can't read the first four chapters of 1 John without getting to that. God loves you. He's made a way to be, forgive you. He's the, the people to deny that he's come to make atonement for our sins. Those are big theological words. Make it right that I screw up. Forgive me. Pay the price for my wrongdoings. Whatever. It's all about he loves us so much. So, we have to love each other. Or do we get to love each other? Do we want to because of what Christ has done for us? See, we... When I said there's all these do's and don'ts in the first three chapters, it's really about... Not do's and don'ts, it's about what we should be like. I put some verses from each chapter coming up to here so you can see what I'm talking about. If we go to 1 John 1, 5 to 7, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him but walk in the darkness, we lie. We do not live in the truth, but if we walk in the light, he is as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Well, that was one of the things we talked about, what, four or five weeks ago? We have to walk in the light. But if it was like a command, you better walk in the light or you don't have anything to do with Jesus. It's totally different than saying, Jesus is light, and we can't be living in and, you know, we, we talk about the, what happens in the dark compared to what happens in the light. When we're hiding, when we're secretive, when we're all, oh, what's best for me? That's not, it's more a measure of whether you are than a command of what you shouldn't be or I'm going to be. What's our image of God? Is it the image of God, the one who's saying, okay, let me help you get better and better and better to teach you, to walk with you, to help you? Or is he the one with the hammer waiting for us to step out of line to go? <laughs> so it's not that, is it? But that's how we feel sometimes when we screw up. Chapter 2, same kind of thing. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister, he's still in the darkness. Anyone who loves his brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing in him that will make him stumble. Chapter 3. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Anyone who lives in him and keeps on sinning, no one who continues to sin has either seen him or knows him. It's more a measure of whether we know Christ or not than a command. Okay, takes us to verse 7 to 9 of chapter 4. And this is really, oh boy, how long have I been? And I'm finally getting to the message. Hmm. Sorry. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love amongst us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. You see why it's so important that he said, you know, the spirits and the people that tell you Jesus 
isn't from God or he didn't come into the world and he doesn't love you and he didn't. These are the verses just before this. He wants to nail down that Jesus is love and he's doing this for you. You can trust him and it's important to him that you treat your brothers and sisters differently. Same one, verse 10 to 12. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one who has ever seen, seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. He loved us. We love because he loved us first. Whoever claims to love God and yet hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he who gives us this command anyone who loves God must love his brother and sister Heavenly Father I pray that your love washes away all fear as your word says as we read this morning you see just like the guy with the kid, if I said, hit me with the shovel, who says, I don't like the taste of institutionalized food, is the reason. Isn't, he's not going to hit me, but it's not doing him any credit. Real love drives away the fear. There's something very special about scripture. Have any of you ever seen that, that picture, the artist's rendering of all the connections between scripture? There's, it's like a light show. It's got all the scripture at the bottom, each chapter, different lines, different colors for the books. And then it's lines that go back and forth for every time scripture refers to itself. There's 63,000, I think it was 477 times scripture refers to itself. So someone tells you that scripture is just this disjointed thing of 46 books or whatever that don't really match. And No, scripture is about going back and forth. So I'm going to read you the same thing from another place. So you know this isn't just a thought from one book from John taking one thing out of context. My command is this. Love, one of, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everyone that I learned from my father, hmm, King James again there, right? Eh? Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. That's from the book of John. Amazing how the same guy had the same kind of thoughts. I love it that John the Apostle calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Especially when he messes up and he's putting some of his own errors into what he did there. Because he doesn't want to make himself seem perfect. He wants to make himself like one of us. Somebody who's not perfect, but is striving to be perfect because God is perfect.
but only because God loved them so much. Heavenly Father, I pray for each and every one of us as we go about this week. Because I know our enemy tries to steal nuggets of truth that you put into our hearts. And he's also our accuser who watches for when we don't do something right and then he points it out and says, and you call yourself a Christian. You say you love Jesus. Didn't John say, like, um, if you do that, you not really have any part of him? I know the accuser, Lord. Please, please, tie down in our hearts that we love you only because of what you've done for us. You did it first. And when we do mess up, I pray that we keep close accounts with you this week. That when the accuser comes, it just reminds us to go to you because your love will drive out all the fear. It'll cause us to draw close to you, not hide not to live in the darkness, but to come to your light, your cleansing, forgiving, powerful light. In Christ's name, amen. I had one other thing I wanted to share with you, and I, I'm kind of struggling whether I, I don't get enough chances, so here we go. I'm going to... Can I, can I just take a couple minutes and give you a rabbit trail here? There's something very interesting that Christians do. We try to get the world to live like Christians. And it's a pretty natural thing, because if we really believe that God loves us, and if we do things his way, it's so much better, because we, we live such great lives when we follow his his rules. But the world doesn't know Jesus, and they don't love Jesus, and it all sounds like rules and regulations when we try to make them live our way. It's hard. We're kind of in a catch-22. We sound judgmental when we say you should... We can just live our life as an example of how Christ lived, and don't be surprised if it costs us anything and just keep loving people because that's what Christ did and that's what we do and we and then they're going to ask us why that's why it says always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have within you not to live judgmentally but to always be ready to give an answer for why we have joy why we have hope or why we don't give up why we keep doing the right thing, even when nobody's looking. I heard a guy talking about this idea that he had a neighbor move in next door who was a Christian. One of these born-again Christians goes to church twice on Sundays, he said. And he's really a cool guy, because like we have our parties, and we drink too much, and we laugh, and we... And he never gives me a hard time. He never says, he never tells me I should this and this and this and this. I thought he's a cool guy, this Christian guy next door. And then I thought, wait a minute. This guy thinks I'm going to rot in hell. And he doesn't even care enough about me to tell me otherwise. <laughs> We're in a catch-22 situation. We always have to be ready give an answer for why we have hope. We always have to live in the light and we always have to be walking that fine line between saying there's a better way of doing things. This path that the world and you don't have to just say the world, like I mean turn on the TV and see what's on every show pretty well is leading you to a life of chaos, a life without hope, a life without joy, and eventually will take you to hell. How do you say that without being judgmental? You do it by staying in step with the Spirit, which will tell you when to come and help. 
when to do the things that, that keep them from facing the consequences of their sin. When to rescue. Don't be shocked if when they're still screwed up, we're called to, at great expense to ourselves, be Christ-like to them. If you think that it's going to not cost you anything to live like Christ, look at what it costs Christ to pay the price for our sins. That's what calls out to people that they're actually love me is they help me, they take care of me, they don't judge me, they're not waiting with a hammer for me to step out of line to mock or to they're there to care about me and that's what loving is about so just live a life of love first of all to our brothers and sisters in Christ but then be like Christ to the people that don't know him live a life that cares That's not from the scripture, out of context. I think it's true. I think I could back it up with scripture, but we don't have another two hours, do we? So just don't be shocked if it costs you something to live a life of love like Christ. Heavenly Father, as our worship team comes back and we just sing praises to you, I pray that your Holy Spirit reminds us and then throughout the week reminds us of your love for us. That it's not about our rules, it's not about do's and don'ts. It's about imitating our Heavenly Father, our Savior Christ. In Christ's name, amen.